is something you probably have heard also, maybe not in regular elementary school, but then you may have met it in a physics course or something where you just do it. I mean, basically, you probably don't think too much, you just do it. And even if you were using your computer to do math in high school, you may have done something like this, I mean, many times without thinking too much about it, just putting in a line and some, I mean, you've done it many times probably. It's called the least squares method. It's the name for the method that tells us how should we compute the line? What's the formula to compute the slope and the intercept based on the input data? I haven't shown you that, I've just shown you the line, right? And I've showed you that R computes it for us. I didn't show you the formula for how to compute it. Let's think about a good way, and, and in a way, why should we, can, I mean, what should be the criterion? How should we, in a way, make some thinking that would lead us to, uh, how should I even do that? I mean, how should, what, what kind of thinking should I do? Well, here's a good idea. <laughs> which is used, the good idea is, let's try to put in a line such that it is very close to all the points. Right? Doesn't that seem like a nice idea? If, um, if, I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna make a line that sort of represents those points, let me put in a line that is close to the points. Which means, that the difference between the points and the line should be as small as possible, right? That is what is expressed here. Let's minimize, and, and the, the residuals was the name for the difference between the points and the line, right? So let's try to make the line such that these residuals, at least in this sense, it, it could be measured in different ways. Uh, Ad admittedly, it's not the only possible way to, to, to do it, it's the classical way. The least squares approach is the classical way. But how? Hmm. Yeah, here is expressed more and I think I should add a little thing here. Explicitly, we are going to minimize the residual sum of squares. It could be <coughs> expressed like this. We are going to minimize the difference Here it is expressed theoretically. Ah, sorry, I, of course should have this one in, otherwise it doesn't make sense. I should try to find the combination of beta naught and beta one that minimizes the difference between the observations and the line. Here's the line, right? This is a mathematical optimization challenge. This is a, the x and the y, when I use it on numbers, the x and the y are just numbers. I plug in the x and y. So this is mathematically, this thing here is mathematically a function of two unknowns, beta naught and beta one. How do I minimize such a function? Well, I take the derivatives and I equal to zero and I solve. It's a classical bivariate optimization challenge that you c could be taught in math classes how to do, right? And then when you found the solution, you need to check that it's the right type of optimum or minimum that you're uh, looking for. I'm not gonna do that. You can see an extra math video and you can see in the notes. It's not part of your curriculum to dig into such proofs in this course, but the proof is there if you want to dig into it. It's not rocket science, but if, hey, if you can accept it and understand it, you don't have to dig into the proof in a way. The result of this can be expressed and I'm showing you now, I'll show you the formula, and then I look at the plot afterwards. The result of this minimization problem is expressed in a theory. And here's a little tricky thing about names and uh, how we express them that may confuse you. And it's just a fact of life that, that it is confusable, but it's not going to confuse us when we are going to work with these things in practice. It's just confusing when we talk about things conceptually and theoretically. Here's the thing. 
Here is the formula expressed as it is in 5.4, and then I just look at it, and here is the same formula. Look at this, same formula. The only change, sorry for this jumping back and forth, I know some of you don't like it, but uh, I like it. Um, um, here is this formula where I write it in the way that it can be used with small y. So this is a plug-in formula where I can plug in the y's and the x's and then use it as a method to compute beta 1 hat and beta 0 hat. It could also be interpreted like this, and that is for our theoretical conceptual talk about statistics. That is important to be able to think like that also. Our challenge is we don't distinguish notation-wise. We decided not to. So we don't have a small beta 1 hat and a capital beta 1 hat in a way. We just have beta 1 hat that could mean both things. What I mean by this is that is what we're going to uh, dig into in a, in a minute. The thing is, we can see the estimates as random variables also. I mean, next time I do the experiment, I get a new outcome, right, of the y's. However, for now, here is the formula, right? And if you look in the note, you'll see the examples following the theorem, where the theorem uses capital Y's, just plug-ins as if it was using small y. As I say, I'm sure it's confusing now, but it's not going to be confusing when we use these things because there is really only one version for us to, to use here. It's just in our conceptual talking of things, it could challenge us, right? Um, so, here's the formula. I didn't dwell on the formula yet. Let's look at the picture and then let's get back to the formula just to illustrate what we've done now. Here is a picture illustrating that there is a model, that's the black one, that's the one I looked at first. The model is the true line, right? The true population relation between height and weight, weight and height. In practical applications of such regression analysis, of course, this black line is not there. What we do, the, the red line is the one we compute from the data, right? And the red line is used as an estimate of the unknown black line. That's the idea. That we use the data to give an estimate of an underlying true line that we assumed that are out there, but we don't know it. Right? Now, for illustration, I show you there is an underlying true line. That's the model. And then we try to find out what it is by using the data to compute the best v squares line, which is the beta hat line. And then we can also measure the difference. And then that co we call the residuals, or sometimes we use the hat to be explicit, and now it's the computed residuals that we can look at the deviations from each point and the line, right? These are all the values, these vertical distances, you could say. It's the sum of the square of those that we have minimized. So we minimize the vertical y distances to the line. That is the least squares line, the line that gives the smallest, the least square, the smallest squares, right, the least square. That's what we have, that's what the formula says. I would like to make the link back to chapter one, actually, because in chapter one, we talked about, and we're going to do that a bit more later, but remember, we talked about that we could measure the relation between such two variables by a correlation coefficient, right? And I also mentioned something which was part of computing the correlation coefficient. I mentioned something which was called the covariance between x and y, which is basically the, what is up here in the numerator, apart from the n minus 1 factor. So if I, this is in chapter 1, from chapter 1 notation, I realize that the slope between the slope of y seen as a function of x is the covariance between x and y divided by the x variance, right? We can also see that this s, we, there's some names here used. We have tried to minimize the use of such names. If you look at other textbooks, you'll see much worse uh, additional number of s, this, s, that, and sub, and suck, and all that. We have tried to minimize it in a way, because at the end of the day, we're going to use R to compute these things for us, of course. We're 
are going to do it ourselves by hand. Um, so we don't need hand calculation formulas, really. We just need the defining formulas to try to understand what's going on, and then R to compute them for us. Right. This is the defining formula. Look at the SX here. This is basically, this is basically n minus 1 times the x variance, right? It's the, it's the x variability without dividing by n minus 1 in a way. So it's a new name for something we have, almost something we have seen previously, right? Just without, when we don't divide by the n minus 1, we call it capital S x x. It's a name used here in the regression setting. Let's uh, just dwell a second on how to, based on such a, we call it a simulated example, but it's, it's in a way, maybe a better word would be, it's a constructed example based on a little simulated, one set of simulated data. So it's not a real simulation in the sense that we talked last time, it's just an illustration here of uh, how things could go about. So the way it's, it's done here, and then that can be useful in the understanding of statistics to use simulations. So now I use it as an illustrative tool, as a pedagogical tool, not as an analysis tool, right? I make some artificial x. I have 20x uniformly between minus 2 and 4. That's just a choice, arbitrary choice of some x's between minus 2 and 4. Then. I construct the model now because I'm going to just make an illustration. So I try to use R to construct the model. I say that the slope is 50. Sorry, the intercept is 50, the slope is 200. And the sigma, the average deviation to the line should be 90. Then I generate the Y following the model, the regression model that I set up before, right? The beta naught, the beta 1 times X, and then I simulate random normal errors by the R norm with zero mean and the sigma. I don't know if I set variance, but the sigma is the standard deviation of 90 in this case. And from there on, I have two sets of data, X and Y. I could plot them. That's what I showed you already, so I'm not jumping into R because this is the R details can making what I just showed you. I jump back now, making very far back, such this. And then the line, I move forward to my R code that I was discussing. I make the plot. And just to show you, we could, of course, easily compute those the slope and the intercept ourselves using manually the formula that you have been given, right? At least manually by R, in a way. That makes it easy because I could easily find beta hat by taking SXX, here's SXX, the sum of the squared values of X minus the mean of X, so that is SXX, and up here I take the sum of the product of the y deviances and the x deviances, right? x deviances times the y deviances, and then I add them up. That's exactly the formula put into uh, R um, syntax, right? Basic R syntax, where we explicitly make R do the computations that the formula tells us to do. Right? Explicitly translating the formula into R calculation. That can easily be done. I think now I should probably jump into R because I would like to show you. Here I have the, can you see it? I should probably, sorry. a bit of a balance here. If I increase too much, the overview gets maybe lost, but let's see if it works. So this is the kind of, this is the example that I was showing. I have 
something else going here. Here is a, a little nicer plot, not as nice as the one in the slide, but here you see the points. Um, then I could find beta 1 hat and beta 2 hat, slope of 200, and the intercept of 49. Look at the intercept. The intercept is just combining the mean of x and y with the slope. So that's how it goes. You compute the slope first by this computation of the covariance. Then you use the slope to make sure that the line is at the right position. Right? You get the slope, and the, the, the intercept is just the mean of y minus the slope times the mean of x. So you use the mean of y, mean of x, and the slope, and you have the intercept. That's the way it goes if you were to do it by yourself. Right? Um, let's just uh, show you that if I now do covariance x times y, that's the, what I claimed. So that I told you that, that such a function exists back in chapter 1. That's the, just the key, some summary statistics. Divided by the variance of x, let's see what that gives us. Well, I told you it was the same, right? So the slope is the covariance divided by the variance of x. Or, as I've told you, we can just as well use this LM Look at this. If we use this linear model function, it gives us the intercept and the slope as I've just computed, right? So it, it's just given to us. So it's, R is using those formulas to give us, and it, it uses the word intercept and it writes x here because that was my name for the x. If I write height there, it would put height there to tell me that when I read off the coefficient, I will get the slope for the relation between weight and height. That's the interpretation. Let's just dwell on, um, I would like to, because we jump, I would like to go back to the results. And here I have it on the slide, not in R. The results on the weight here again, just to make you think a little bit. Could I just ask, do we have the visitor on Grandjust already in the room? Hope she'll be here. I'm waiting for her. Um, let us interpret the results again on this uh, application here. The 1.1 is the interesting piece of information here, right? Expressed as the line, the black line. Let's just uh, skip the, 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 these error bars. Uh, that'll be after the break. What is the interpretation of the 1.11? Hey, that's your elementary school thinking. That means that we expect that persons being one centimeter higher than other persons will on average weigh 1.1 kilo more, right? That's the interpretation of the 1.1. It's how weight depends on height. So one centimeter gives 1.1 kilogram. That's uh, on, on average, right? Uh, that's uh, the interpretation. What is the interpretation of the slope? That's a funny thing. So let's uh, think about that and make us be a bit critical here also. The slope, of course, technically, it's where the line hits the y-axis, right? So if you want to be strict about it, it's the, it is the weight of persons being zero centimeters, right? It is the weight of persons being <coughs> zero centimeters because it's weight as a function of height. What is the weight of persons being zero centimeters? Minus 120 kilograms. Whoa, this is a pretty astonishing model, right? What's going on here? Any of you studying physics? You think physics people like such a model? <laughs> yeah, that's a really, really nice and relevant realistic model, right? That uh, 
that uh, takes us to predict. We can go back, because at, at some point uh, we will hit the zero, right? Maybe at, I don't know how many centimeters, we could count back, of course. Uh, anyway, at 60 centimeters, 40 centimeters will be zero kilograms, right? I don't know, somewhere. <coughs> what the f is going on here? I shouldn't swear so much, but this is worth a bit of swearing. Well, it's just two reminders that no trees grow completely into the sky, right? A model is just a model. And the short saying is all models are wrong. <laughs> but uh, quite a few of them are useful. Um, it could definitely be pretty valid to talk about a linear relationship between weight and height within this range of data that we're looking at. But to take that to predict weights for all other heights and take it as uh, even if we go to our sort of as the growth curve of our, how we uh, develop, this is a cross-sectional study of adults, right? This is not trying to model the growth curve uh, uh, time-wise, longitudinal growth curve of uh, individuals back to when they are even uh, produced uh, inside the thing of the mom where they are produced. I'm not the expert there. Um, The model is good here, but never, so the short uh, conclusion to say is never extrapolate, right? You shouldn't extrapolate because you don't know at all what would be going on beyond the data you have. Never extrapolate. Interpolate, interpolation is fine. That's even maybe the purpose of a regression model. That is to get information about the height, information about the weight for all possible values of the height within the range of the data. If I, with the data, I can maybe justify my linearity assumption within the range, but many things in real life, in physical things, chemical things, are not really linear. They are sigmoidal of some kind. The real model is probably sigmoidal, right? Nonlinear things. But as long as we only study the sigmoidal curve within the linear part, it's fine to use a linear model for that part, as long as we realize that that's what we're doing. There's no difference between the real sigmoidal and the linear model within the linear part of the sigmoidal model. Right. So, so uh, it's fine. Good. Do we have the visitor from Grundvist in the room? I am going to have a talk with this lady. <laughs> so instead of a nice visit by her, maybe she'll be here running in the room in a sec. Um, or... We will do our statistics part, actually. And then we'll postpone the break a little bit because we'll probably use a bit more than five minutes for this part. You'll get your 15 minutes, don't worry. 